Welcome, this is Deep Dive featuring Hudson Institute. I'm Jonathan Hassan, and in today's edition, we'll focus, of course, on the latest developments pertaining to Israel, the United States, Europe, the implications of the strike on the Islamic Republic of Iran, and ongoing battlefronts, both in Lebanon, the Gaza Strip, Yemen, and much more. To do that, let's turn right now first to introduce our panelists, to include Dr. Mike Duran, formerly a U.S. National Security Council Senior Director uh, for the Middle East and North Africa regions, currently a senior fellow and the director of the Center for Peace and Security in the Middle East at Hudson Institute. Uh, next to him, retired Colonel Joel Rayburn, formerly a U.S. Special Envoy for Syria, a senior director at the NSC in Washington, and uh, currently a senior fellow at Hudson Institute, also joining us is Mr. Ezra Cohen, uh, formerly a U.S. Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, uh, currently an adjunct fellow at Hudson Institute. And last but not least, Brigadier General in Reserve, Dr. Amnon Sofrin, formerly the Chief of Intelligence at Mossad uh, and a senior officer at the IDF Intelligence Directorate. It's great to see you all. And let's start with you, Dr. Duran. What can you update us with on the latest, with chief focus, of course, on the dramatic events that occurred on Saturday early morning? Well, uh, good morning, Jonathan. It's great to be here, and uh, I think it's a very good morning. Uh, Israel, of course, carried out for the first time a very large-scale attack on, uh, uh, on Iran. Uh, in my view, I, I'll be very interested to hear what our colleagues have to say, but in my view, it was a great success. The Israelis stayed within the red lines that the Biden administration set them of not attacking uh, oil infrastructure, not attacking nuclear infrastructure, uh, not going after senior leaders in the regime. Um, and even while staying within those uh, those really uh, pretty narrow bounds, they managed to, to achieve some uh, remarkable successes. They took out all of Iran's uh, air defenses, leaving the country naked uh, in the event of any future attack. And they also focused on taking out the uh, solid fuel ballistic missiles that Iran has. Well, not taking out the missiles, but taking out a critical element in the production uh, chain of those, um, of those missiles. Of course, uh, Iran still has the stockpiles of those missiles, uh, but it's going to have trouble now uh, for many, many months to come making any new ones. These, of course, were the the missiles that Iran used in the last ballistic missile barrage against Israel. This is the most dangerous weapon from the Israeli point of view. Uh, so what they have done, basically, uh, in my view, is that they have, the Israelis have reestablished escalation dominance. They put the Iranians in a very difficult situation. If the, Iranian, the Iranians don't respond, they look very weak. If they do respond, they, they have been given a very clear signal from Israel that Israel will come in and will take away from them things that they even hold more dear than the ballistic missile, um, than the ballistic missile production capabilities that uh, Israel has destroyed. Uh, they've also, uh, by the way, just reinforced the fact that they have uh, an incredible in intelligence penetration of Iran. If uh, the Ayatollah Khamenei so much as utters an anti-Semitic remark in the privacy of his own bathroom, the Israelis are going to know about it and they're going to be able to do something in response. So all in all, a very good day, I think. Indeed. Well, you said that latter point, I saw a grin on Mr. Uh, Dr. Sofrin's uh, face, and therefore let's move now to central Israel. Uh, Dr. Sofrin, a good weekend. Indeed. A very good one. A very successful one. If you look at what happened, uh, first of all, I agree with what Mike said, but uh, we deliver a message to Iran on two dimensions. The first one, that uh, you are very vulnerable. Now that you don't have the anti-aircraft anti batteries, no more. You cannot protect and you cannot defend your very critical infrastructures. And we can come every time, whenever you like, and do whatever we want. That means we can attack infrastructures of oil, of energy, of gas, and of course the nuclear facilities in Iran. And they know that we have the ability because they watch what happens in the Middle East. They saw what happened in Beirut when we bombed the shelter of Nasrallah, with what, which was about 50 meters beyond, below the ground. 
and they gather and kill them so we can get as well to these facilities in Iran where uh, what we call they uh, develop their nuclear capabilities and we can do that as well. We didn't do it this time, but uh, it of course, now it's more easy for us and more convenient since they don't have the anti-aircraft uh, <coughs> defense capabilities. Second, we deliver the message that uh, we will be willing to engage with Iran on any dimension whenever the light, whenever it's needed. And we don't uh, give up and we don't uh, fear anymore to get into Iran. And now they have to calculate whatever, what, how do, do they do, how do they going, how are they going to respond? That means that uh, they have two, cap two uh, options. The first one is uh, to give, uh, to, to try to strike back with the uh, full power and that will drag a full attack of Israel on Iran. And of course, uh, more lethal than this one. And the second one is to give some, uh, let's say, moderate response that will not drag Israel, Israel to get into a, another very big and very uh, hard strike on their facilities. Indeed. Well, uh, Mr. Cohen, I'd like to ask you, since uh, uh, I, I follow all of you on Twitter, but uh, you provided some uh, update on Twitter the other day that I had the opportunity to follow following the strike. Uh, you mentioned some lessons that DOD should learn, uh, the Defense uh, Department, with regard to American weapon systems, namely the F-35I, the uh, uh, F-15s that were involved, uh, f uh, uh, Sixteens that were involved in others, uh, and the manner in which they basically overwhelmed uh, the S-300 uh, PMU-2 systems that the Iranians have alongside their S-400 radar systems, uh, the most advanced radar systems, and really being able to take out whatever Israel intended to without too much of a difficulty. Yes, thanks, Jonathan. The the S 400 and S-300 technology isn't just present in Iran, it's also present in Russia and other U.S. adversaries. Uh, the fact that the Israelis were able to defeat this system, not just with the capabilities of the aircraft, but they were also likely using various radar uh, jamming technology um, and other uh, standoff weapons that have their own uh, countermeasures, they were able to defeat this, the, really the most advanced Russian uh, air systems. Um, the fact that they weren't successful to deny uh, the F-35's operations in Iranian airspace is something that the U.S. government will be looking at very, very closely, especially uh, for our other the U.S. contingency planning. The last thing I'll just say, I want to respond to one thing Mike said. I totally agree that this was a uh, tactical and operational success. I agree that they were able to eliminate the air defense system. Um, and certainly that sends a very strong message to Iran that uh, there, there really is no part of the country that uh, can't be touched. But I think on the Iranian side, what they learned is that Israel is extremely susceptible. Uh, even when responding to the largest ballistic missile attack in history, Israel is extremely susceptible to the wills and the coercion of the U.S. government. Um, and that's something that uh, is of great concern to me. Indeed. Well, uh, Colonel Rayburn, your take on this and potentially also let's broaden uh, the discussion into how do countries in the region actually observing this very sophisticated aerial attack, um, realizing that uh, the QME, the power disparity, is, of course, very significant at the advantage of Western civilization at large and Israel in particular. Yeah. Well, Israel just won an operational victory over the Iranian regime and demonstrated that if it comes to a full-on war between Israel and the Iranian regime, Israel will win that war decisively and probably pretty quickly. What about everything short of that in the region? Uh, the Iranians are involved in political conflicts and actually violent conflicts in, in some cases in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, and in the Palestinian territories. Now, in light of uh, in light of the of the the reality check that was just issued, the dose of reality that was just issued to the Iranian regime over over the weekend, 
what are the ripple effects from from that reality check into these conflicts in these Arab countries where the Iranian regime has been militarily intervening uh, for for quite some time? Will there be a follow up? What would be needed there is a political strategy and an economic strategy to capitalize on the military gains that have just been established. Israel cannot do that, except in the Palestinian territories. It seems pretty clear that Israel can, through military means and the political and economic means that it has at its disposal, it can actually force the Iranian regime out of the Palestinian question, probably, at least significantly enough uh, to, to be able to reset the parameters of the Israel uh, Palestinian uh, crisis. But in the other countries, uh, following up on these military gains is something that Israel cannot do. It's something that the United States, Western allies, and Arab allies will have to do. Where is the plan for that? There doesn't appear, the, the Biden Harris administration doesn't be postured, uh, seem to be postured to take advantage of that. It's, it's not in their inclination. They're still in a mode of de escalation, detente, appeasement with the Iranian regime, not following up and capitalizing using the kind of means that they have, economic pressure, international political isolation. So there's a vacuum right there. There's no, there's no follow-up in those countries. And if there isn't, then the Iranians and their agents in those countries will get comfortable again, come out from, uh, from, from hiding and so on, and then the Arab world will look and say, okay, well, that, doesn't, that reset between Israel and Iran is limited to just between conflict just between Israel and Iran. And things will go on as normal with an Iranian creeping takeover in these other capitals. And that's that's something that we have to be cognizant of. And, and whatever is the next U.S. administration really ought to reformulate a policy to uh, to address that. Dr. Duran, your take on that? I totally agree with what uh, both Ezra and Joel said, of course. Um, I, am, I, too, am concerned about the um, uh, unreadiness, let's say, of Washington to um, to capitalize on the real advantages that Israel um, has uh, has provided the United States at this moment, but let's uh, let's let's focus for, for the moment. To, let's take today. In my view, I want to take today to just savor uh, how much success there there has been. One of the things that um, one of the things that happened here uh, over the weekend is that Israel has, I think, effectively uh, removed the Iranian ballistic missile threat from the, it separated it from the, the Lebanon theater. Israel now has a free hand, a freer hand to deal with Hezbollah in, in Lebanon. And that is the thorniest part. It's always been the thorniest part of the uh, Iranian threat to, to Israel. In Gaza, Israel has, Israel has defeated Hamas as a military organization. It is yet to defeat it as a political organization. But as Joel said, I think that's going to happen. The Israelis have the upper hand there. Uh, there is, uh, sooner or later, Hamas as a political organization is going to be crushed in, uh, in Gaza. Hezbollah in Lebanon is much harder to defeat uh, because it has these missiles, drones, ballistic missiles that can con they can continue to fire at Israel. Those are very hard to suppress. Israel needs a lot more uh, time and effort to degrade Hezbollah further, and it's able to do that now without having to worry about being uh, subjected to ballistic missile barrages from Iran. So it's uh, uh, um, it's got a, a a further leg up in Lebanon now. General Sofrin, when we're looking at the proxies, not only in Lebanon, but also Ansar Allah in Yemen, uh, the Houthis, uh, and then we see also Al-Shabaab, even in Somalia, we're seeing an increased uh, uh, effort, orchestrated effort by the Iranians to double down on their influence in Iraq, uh, something that, of course, Colonel Rayburn also mentioned. But uh, ultimately, everything is interconnected, and they're all looking at what the Iranians sustained over the weekend, are they concerned? And if so, how does that translate into the field? I'm not sure they're very concerned. First of all, they saw that Iran is vulnerable. They saw the power and the ability of, uh, of uh, Israel to strike very fast, very deep, very accurate, not only on Iran, but uh, also in Yemen. Just uh, bear in mind that uh, we attacked twice, the Al Hudeda naval port in, in uh, Yemen, and uh, that's equivalent on distance from Iran. That means that we have abilities to strike everywhere and uh, anywhere we can and then whenever we choose and whenever we like. Now regarding other proxies, um, the, I league agree with Mike but not totally and I will explain. That means that we manage 
to fight Hezbollah before without the Iranian interference. The Iranian launched the ballistic missiles not because of Hezbollah, but as a payback on what happened to Hassan Nasrallah, what happened to their general who was with Nasrallah in that shelter when he was killed, and other, and other events as well. And uh, that was something they prepared in return to what we did to them. Now, regarding Lebanon, they didn't interfere directly in what happens in Lebanon. They, of course, want to preserve the abilities of Hezbollah, and they will uh, try to uh, minimize the damage to Hezbollah and to try to bring it back to the position it was before this war was launched. On the other hand, the pro-Iranian or backed Iranian militias from, uh, yeah, from uh, Iraq under the roof of uh, Hashtar Shabi are still launching uh, what we call kamikaze drones into Israel and trying to uh, hit Israel, and they succeeded many times in uh, launching these missiles into Israel, sorry, these drones into Israel, and they don't stop, and they didn't pay even one inch so far, unlike the other proxies. The Houthis will not back because of the fact that we uh, attacked Iran because they have their own ide ideology, their own interests, and they will still go on attacking vessels at the Red Sea and at the Gulf of Aden and will try to hit Israel as well. So I don't think that the proxies are now paralyzed because of the fact that they attacked Iran and Iran is still alive and kicking and they're still in power and it can still activate all these proxies to do more things to Israel. Thank you, General. Uh, Mr. Cohen, uh, the Chinese have invested a couple of years ago roughly 400 billion U.S. dollars over the course of 25 years in vital infrastructure in Iran to include energy infrastructure, telecommunications, and others. Uh, naturally, if the Iranians attack Israel once more, these will be subject to a retaliatory strike, potentially in the first wave or in a second, but nonetheless, they are subject to such a reality. And on the other hand of that coin, uh, we also need to keep in mind that uh, some of those solid propellant fuels that uh, Israel has struck uh, will now frustrate uh, Iran's ability to fulfill its pledges to the Russians about uh, deliveries uh, or timely deliveries uh, for Moscow's war of aggression against uh, Ukraine. So uh, if we look at both theaters, how do those strategic power competition actors uh, recognize potentially their own footprint within this whole constellation? Well, first of all, the Chinese are always playing all sides, and uh, we continue to have Chinese investment in Israel, and we continue to have Israeli companies that are working in China. And uh, I, I actually think the Chinese probably aren't very concerned about any of the infrastructure they've invested in being hit because the Biden administration was successfully able to get the Israelis not to strike that type of uh, those types of uh, um, dual use, I'll say, targets. So. And th this is really the key point, just, and, and I'm not answering your question exactly, Jonathan, but we keep saying, you know, if Iran strikes back, Israel will do this. If that happens, the, the reality is the U.S. has shown that it is able to control Israel's planning and uh, military operations vis-a-vis -vis Iran. So I'm not actually sure how truly afraid the Iranians are as long as the Biden and Kamala administration remain in office because they know they will not allow Israel to, to take this to kind of the logical next step. So really, the key thing I, I would just put out there, what Israel needs to be worried about right now is how do they contain potential uh, Iranian breakout, that is their ability to develop a weapon between now and January 20th? That really is the key thing, um, because their ability to do that through kinetic action is going to be is going to be limited. Very interesting indeed, uh, Colonel Rayburn. What's next? Well, look in the, in the big picture. I want to I want to zoom out even further uh, from what I mentioned before about the Arab world. In the, in the bigger picture, I think what just happened over the weekend is the the demonstrated uh, end of the viability or perceived viability of the Iranian regime's strategic doctrine, which under uh, Ali Khamenei for more than 30 years has been to invest only, almost exclusively in asymmetric 
capabilities, meaning militias, uh, ballistic missiles, terrorism as their main deterrent, their primary deterrent, their primary defense. They really, so you essentially, you have a middle power here, which has not invested at all in its own uh, defense over the last, in, in the post-Iran-Iraq uh, war phase. This is a strategic doctrine they adopted in the, after the Iran-Iraq war. Try, essentially, like it, it's a sort of a forward defense deterrent, if you will. They want to intervene in the neighboring countries that might be a threat to them so as to be safe at home, but without then investing in the things you would try to build to defend yourself. A territorial army, an air force, an air and missile defense, and, and a navy. They have none of those. They've invested almost none. I mean, the, the air force that they're operating is the Shaw era air force with some MiGs from the Soviets in the 1980s mixed in. The Israelis demonstrated that those are not, they, they might as well not exist. Uh, and so there has to be, there, I, I think it, it'd be interesting to know if there's a, a recalibration that, that will go on inside the Iranian regime. What has been the Iranian regime's strategic decision making? Is this where they expect it to be in October of 2023? Now, a little over a year later, since, <clears throat> since uh, one of their clients on October 7th launched the, the, launched the raid into Israel, and then October 8th, Hezbollah, under Iranian direction, joined that conflict. It is the denuding of the Iranian regime uh, militarily, is that where they expect it to be right now? I think they were dreaming big. They thought that they had a window of opportunity to drive the United States out of the region, to neutralize Israel permanently, and to then sort of have their way as a hegemon in the region, but without any of the things that a, a middle power would normally have uh, to do that with strategically. And that's failed because of this this reality check of the power disparity. It should, I would think, inside a rational regime that would discredit Ali Khamenei as, and, and the doctrine that he's been, uh, and he and the Revolutionary Guards leadership, I think you have to say, for the last three decades have, have been following. There should be a reset about, hey, didn't we get over our skis here? Aren't we now in danger if we do escalate of, of uh, uh, an actual existential threat to our regime? So we'll see. Indeed. Well, we're drawing near to the end of the program, and I'd like to have each of you having a closed uh, closing statement uh, with a little bit of uh, intrigue for the week ahead. Uh, with that, I would say also, uh, one, what does Iran now do without any air defense capabilities, if uh, one of you could potentially integrate that into the discussion? And with the f uh, November 5th elections just around the corner, how will, once somebody is elected, uh, be it Harris or uh, Trump, uh, will that impact Israel's decision make, uh, making according to whoever is uh, winning? Dr. Duran, we'll start with you. So I think that the first thing the Iranians are going to do is they're going to go to Moscow and say, help us reconstitute some of our air defense systems. The second thing they're going to do is they're going to go to China and they're going to say, help us rebuild the uh, capability, uh, the the solid fuel ballistic missile capability that we have uh, that we have lost. It'll be very interesting to see how Russia and China respond to that. Let me just ask one other question, and, and that is, with respect to the vacuum that is going to be developing in the region as a result of the dynamic that Joel Rayburn just described, how is Turkey going to read this, and what moves is it going to make? I don't have answers to that. These are just things we have to watch closely. Mr. Cohen? I think the key thing is going to be uh, what steps can Israel take, as I said before, to make sure that there is not a that Iran does not develop a nuclear weapon before January 20th. And one thing that everybody needs to understand, the second that the Iranians develop a nuclear weapon, uh, not only are the U.S. options going to be significantly constrained, mm -hmm. but also Iranian aggression uh, and irregular aggression is going to increase dramatically. And so that's what we're facing. General Sofwin? I think that Iran is, uh, will try to uh, pay back on Israel on a very moderate and very limited capability to strike back because they don't, can't allow themselves to lose face. Second, I don't think that they will go for nuclear uh, capabilities right now even though the revolutionary guards will uh, apply pressure on uh, Khamenei to go to this way, but he is a very careful man and very uh, experienced man. He won't go this way. I thought, don't think that this is 
what we call will drive the event of these attack will drive him to go to nuclear capabilities. Colonel Rayburn, I agree. Uh, I agree with General Sopran. I, I think it'd be very dangerous for the Iranians to try to uh, race for a demonstrated nuclear capability right now. Also, I'm not sure that they're actually within that range. They're certainly naked. And, uh, and, and if there were any sign of that, and presumably all of uh, U.S. and Israeli intelligence is geared toward uh, watching for indicators of that. Now, if, if they were to do it, if, if there was a way for them to do it uh, without being seen, it would be as dangerous as Ezra is saying. Uh, but regardless, they, the Iranians probably are not going to make a decision on how to retaliate until they see the outcome of the U.S. election eight days from now. All right. Well, uh, this is unfortunately all the time that we have for today. I'd like to immediately thank Brigadier General in Reserve, Dr. Amnon Sofrin, uh, Mr. Ezra Cohen, Colonel uh, Joel Rayburn, and Dr. Mike Duran. Uh, it's always a pleasure. And I'd like to thank all of you at home as well. Until our next edition of Deep Dive featuring Hudson Institute uh, from here in Jerusalem, wishing you a good day. My name is uh, Doron Gavish and my background uh, 30 years of uh, serving in the Israeli Air Force. My last job I was the commander of the Israeli Air and Missile Defense uh, during the uh, introduction of the Iron Dome to the Defense of Israel. All of this allows me really to be part of the team here in uh, TV7. It is uh, super important to have uh, such a platform. Uh, we talk about the global situation, we talk about Israel and uh, those uh, different angles uh, which are relevant to the discussion. My name is Evan Lerman. I used to be Deputy National Security Advisor to the Government of Israel. I'm currently Vice President of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security, a think tank, and the editor of the Jerusalem Strategic Tribune. For the last few years, I've been a regular panelist for TV7. A fantastic opportunity to bring deep and analytical perspectives to the debate over regional affairs, Israeli affairs, international affairs, in the company of some of the best minds in Israel.